I know everybody's leaving the room when they talk about data. They seem, <laughs> seem to run. <laughs> but um, data is very interesting, and there's a lot of discoveries that you can make with data. And so I want you to sit back, relax, and understand exactly what data is and how data works. This is the voyage of the Chief Data Officer. <laughs> its mission to serve and look at data in the way you have never looked at it before, to clean it, collect it, and display it, going where no data has gone before. The explosion in volume of data available to professionals continue to accelerate across all disciplines in the public and private sectors. And getting the most out of government data resources is a top priority across the public sector at the federal, state, and local levels. This is causing agency leaders, chief data officers, and chief information officers, and all program executives to look for more effective ways to manage and extract insight from all this data. So now that they can drive better missions and outcomes like improved patient care, faster response to natural disasters, and more efficient government operations and improved citizen satisfaction. So data is increasingly be being viewed as a strategic asset that is key to establishing agency priorities and running effective governance and operations. And there is broad interest in implementing advanced analytics and big data solutions such as artificial intelligence, machine learning, and robotic process automation, or what's now known as RPA. This will improve mission outcomes, reduce operational costs, and increase enterprise agility. As a result, nearly all federal agencies prioritize data and analytics related opportunities in their 2018 to 2022 strategic plans, and it's in the President's Management Agenda, which identifies data accountability and trans transparency as one of the key drivers for transformance of information. Furthermore, the Comprehensive Federal Data Strategy and the Evidence-Based Policymaking Act of 2018 emphasize collaboration and coordination to advance data and evidence building functions in the federal government. In this session, we will explore a few themes and discuss real world examples with our panelists on how to get the most out of your data assets. I'm going to allow our panelists to introduce themselves with their names, with agency they're working with, and exactly what they do. We'll start with Ron. Oh. Live long and prosper. <laughs> uh, I'm Ron Thompson. I'm with NASA. I've uh, been in the, uh, this role for about four months now. So I am the associate CIO for transformation, digital transformation, and the chief data officer. I was given that last title about uh, a week before I onboarded. So uh, we had, as Joyce mentioned, the Evidence-Based Act uh, was really uh, operationalized about that time, and the agency had to sort of have a, a belly button to, 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 uh, to poke uh, to appoint as a chief data officer. So, so my job in NASA is pretty, is pretty exciting. So it's really to liberate the data to provide better decision-making um, you know, aspects of what we do. So if you look at NASA, we're not only space, we're aeronautics, and we're science. So that's something that I'm learning very early in my journey. It's just not going to the moon and Mars, because we will do that. The first woman and man will be on, on, the, on the moon by 2024. That's what we're shooting for. So, and we're using data to make that happen. We're using that data uh, within our internal mission areas but we're using that data also with our commercial partners. And I know there are a lot of partners here today, and we have to change the way we've operated historically and be able to share uh, our, our information between inside and outside for different purposes. So it is a very exciting time to be in this, in this role, and we are the enablers uh, for the mission. So that's quite frankly uh, what our role is as, as uh, chief data officer. So. 
Okay, I'm Kirsten Dalbo. I'm the Chief Data Officer at the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. I've been in the role, I think, today four months as well. Um, I came from the Health and Human Services of Office of Inspector General as the Director of Data Operations, and before that as the Chief Data Architect at Department of Homeland Security. Um, but really, I mean, my role at FERC is to um, lead the data strategy, um, set the data architecture, data standards, um, data governance, and then really lead the build out of, of data infrastructure, data engineering, data analytics functions for, for the agency. Um, and so, I mean, FERC has a really exciting mission. Um, I mean, so the mission statement is to um, provide economically efficient, safe, reliable, and secure energy for consumers. Um, but really all of that is data driven. So we need to make sure that we have the right infrastructure to be able to do the analysis to, to make get to those decisions um, and also the right governance process, the right um, understanding of our data so that we're consistent um, and reliable in how we come to those decisions. So that's, that's what I do. So um, Ted Kauk, I'm the Chief Data Officer at the Department of Agriculture. Um, very similar kind of uh, responsibilities in, in our uh, department. I, I, I will kind of rip off of the Star Trek because our, our CIO refers to me as Mr. Data, but we try to bring a human touch, I keep telling him, <laughs> to data. So we are engaging with leaders um, at the highest levels of, of our, um, our uh, eight mission areas and 19 agencies to answer their questions, and we've stood up uh, an enterprise analytics program also establishing um, data officers in each of those missionaries. So talk more about that, but similar responsibilities. Good to be here. Uh, good morning. My name is Pam Isom. I am the Defi Deputy Chief Information Officer with the Department of Energy. I am the um, CDO or Chief Data Officer Advisor. I used to be the Chief Data Officer. I stayed in that role for about a year um, when I joined the Department of Energy and then moved on to become an advisor to the new Chief Data Officer and his staff. Um, my, in my role now, I am responsible for innovation. So because I am accountable and responsible for driving innovation throughout the department, I find myself still tapping into data. So in addition to advising the chief data officer as we are setting up like innovation platforms and um, I, one of the things I did was stood up a community, an innovation community center, and in that we uh, put in place a platform for data exchange and innovation exchange. So um, I'm enjoying myself. Um, I love being uh, an advisor to the chief data officer because, you know, then we can actually try some things out and then give him some advice on uh, what we should be doing versus what we should probably be experimenting with. Um, so right now I uh, am enjoying myself. The Department of Energy has a lot going on. So I'm certainly not bored, and I just thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Thank you. Let's start with one question. What, what kind of steps, I know how daunting it is because all of your agencies have lots of data and lots of information that you have to process and produce and display. So what steps should agencies take right now, I mean, immediately, to better manage your growing footprint because every day it just gets larger and larger and how to wrangle all of that data. How are you managing to do that? What kind of steps are you taking to keep it under control? Sure, I'll start. Um, I mean, this being my third agency, um, data governance, data governance is, <laughs> is the thing um, in my opinion. Um, <laughs> I think, yeah, Homeland Security, HHS, now FERC. I mean, people have some amazing ideas with data. They want to do a lot of things, but really the, the thing that will break a lot of those ideas free and get them into production, um, get them into an enterprise setting where, where people really see them regularly, it's governance. You, you need to have that mechanism to be able to make sure that you can have those conversations, you have that collaboration set up. Um, the number of times I've seen really awesome ideas get killed because we didn't have the right collaborative structure built to be able to have the discussions to make sure that we all agree on what our data means. We know we, how we source the data. Um, I love using a cooking analogy with data um, in that, you know, people on analytics teams, data scientists, they're building cakes. Um, but do we know what recipe we use to to bake that cake? Do we know that it is a safe recipe? Do we know what ingredients we use? Do we know that those ingredients are authoritative, trusted, they're safe, they're not gonna poison anyone? So you need to have that governance structure to make sure um, that that you can really get there. I mean, so that's that's the stewardship, it's the standards, it's the inventories. Um, so I can add to that. So I think in addition to governance that we should think about 
uh, the fact that if there is if data is growing and it's growing tremendously and it's not going to stop, I think we look at the mission of the different departments because there are different uh, um, department or elements within a department, right? So the different bureaus look at the the various missions and then pick out specific use cases as a starting point. Um, if you try to do too much, and I say this all the time, but it's, it's really true. If you try to do too much, nothing will get done. People will get frustrated, they will get aggravated, they will get discouraged. So pick use cases that matter to the, de to the department and to the individual departmental elements as well. And then uh, start the collaboration that needs to occur so that the use cases really mean things to not just you, but across the organization. And then pull teams together to start to look at what information is, is being processed. I mean, that's a great starting point because if you look at the critical path or the critical items, even critical systems, and what is the information that's being processed, that gives you a good starting point. Um, the other day I was in a meeting with uh, some folks from acquisitions in our department, and we were looking at what things could we do to apply AI to uh, advance the, uh, the experiences. And at the heart of that is what are the key processes? What are the systems that are utilized, right? And when are they utilized and is it all manual? And then at the bottom line is what is the information that we are uh, getting involved with, even for the manual processes. Why is it manual? Because they are recording some data somewhere, right? So what do we do with that information once we record it? And what is it that we're recording? I think if we start with small use cases and then let that grow, I believe that that's a bit more manageable in addition to the governance. So I, uh, what I'll add to the conversation is I think there is uh, such an amazing opportunity to get people excited. Uh, you know, there's a lot of requirements in the federal data strategy. I think if we, if we focus on those, uh, we may get bogged down in them. Uh, mm -hmm. One way that we've uh, approached that at USDA is to really focus on prior prioritization, but um, again, adding that human touch. We, we go and meet with people face to face. We, we sit down with them. We understand um, what, what are their key challenges? What are the questions that they're asking? And we ask them to suspend uh, their experiences in the federal government of, of what, what data they think they have access to. And we just ask them to, you know, if they're a beach person or a mountain person, what are the real questions that you have? Um, a, lot of, a lot of cases, we have the, the data to be able to answer those questions, or we have analytical techniques that can help to, 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 to find those, or there's data and other agencies that we can draw on to be able to answer those questions. So, and that's not something that people are used to. So um, when, we, when we started our, uh, our enterprise analytics effort, we, first we focused on where are some, where are some quick wins, mm -hmm. right? Um, thinking about uh, how people are accessing HR information, taking it from all the underlying systems, creating manual reports. Mm -hmm. Uh, if we can create some simple, descriptive dashboards that pull from our enterprise systems, we're saving yeah. people hundreds of hours across the organization of 100,000 people. Um, when we, we focus on emission areas, we're, we're asking them questions uh, about maybe the impact of their programs, and we're pulling on data from uh, the Patent and Trademark Office to see how our research actually leads to patents. These are questions that people can get really excited about. Um, we also put some constraints in place. Uh, we, we set 12 weeks. Uh, for working with each office and each missionary, believe it or not. And that's a, a pretty significant undertaking. Um, uh, there's a, a, a very significant degree of skepticism when you come in and you say you're going to launch an entire missionary, three missionaries' uh, core capabilities of analytics in 12 weeks. Um, but if you're doing it in an iterative way, if you are getting people excited, you're going to get access to that data. Um, and I think that also helps to change the mental model because when you are successful in implementing uh, some real insights uh, that are not just surface descriptors but are are real uh, analytical insights that they haven't seen before, uh, that changes their whole paradigm because now they say, well, now my expectation is that I'm going to be able to do that. And so um, after having done that for a couple years, standing up our enterprise uh, analytics capabilities, we've, we've uh, moved out across all of our mission areas and all of our offices to, to deploy those uh, core capabilities. And now the mission areas not only uh, are going to, but actually want to establish mission areas uh, sorry, establish data officers in their mission areas across our eight mission areas to be able to think strategically about data. Um, in the background, we've been doing the data management maturity assessments, uh, all of those things, but I think now that you have leadership buy-in on seeing what's, what's possible, there's a lot more buy-in to be able to do data governance, to, to, do the, uh, to do maturity assessments, to be able to improve, and to put leadership positions in place who can think strategically. So it's a combination. Actually, I'd like to kind of pull on that thread a little bit. 
uh, about the silos. And Ron, I'll have you answer this because I know at, at NASA, sure. you've got plenty of them. And going along with what Ted was saying, so how are you managing to look at these data silos and foster a culture that encourages sharing and encourages participation? So, so at NASA, um, USDA deals with silos. I think NASA deals with rocketry and different things. So. Uh, but we are compartmentalized. Um, if you just, uh, example that we'll use is uh, our Earth Science um, part of, of NASA. We collect over 24 terabytes a day, and these are what we do to examine the Earth. Uh, we are now, we used to fly over the poles, and now we have satellites collecting data on the poles. So we're learning more about the Earth than we ever had before uh, through, our, through our science mission directorate. Uh, so we, the opportunity, I think, for industry, and you as our industry partners, can really help us, help us classify this, help us set up an ontology, a taxonomy, to share data not only um, with our NASA um, customers inside, but Ted and I were talking beforehand, how can we share data um, among other federal agencies? So I had a thought, and, and we'll just rift on this, Ted. <laughs> so it would be nice to use agricultural data to, to determine how we terraform the moon and Mars. Mm -hmm. What worked here can also work there because we're growing the same things, right, Ted? I, I believe so. We still need the same food. So, so how can we work not only within our silos or rocket tree? but how can we work across uh, government? But we really need our industry partners to help us classify and discover how we're doing things today, and then how we can share among other agencies. So we in the government don't talk to each other much until we get to these kind of, kind of panels, and thank you, Joyce, for bringing us together. Um, so help us, so that's another ask as well, help us classify and discover, but help us work together among other agencies to look at areas of opportunity. So. Well, I think, I think I'm out of my domain of expertise with terraforming, but um, that's nothing new. So, uh, But I, I take it what Ron is also hinting at is that there are really, really big questions, and only government data can help us to answer some of those questions, both in the private and the public sector. And I think those opportunities are continuing to grow. Uh, how do we feed a growing population while reducing our environmental footprint, um, terraforming Mars? Uh, uh, I think when we, when we did it at USDA, part of the conversation is, again, when you, when you realize that you're, you have uh, shared opportunities across those silos mm -hmm. and that by partnering, you're able to answer questions that previously were unanswerable, uh, that is a cultural change in the, pro in, the, in the works. And I think both at our department and across government, that's something that's, I think, beginning to take hold. Um, and I think that the um, foundations for evidence, we were doing this uh, before the, the law was, was in, in place, but it's only kind of a, it's a signal and a reinforcement and, a, and kind of a, a sea change, I think, for, for uh, the opportunities that exist. So. Mm -hmm. That's great. I, I think that's definitely needed because there's a lot of similarities across a lot of the various agencies and be able to share that information so you're only creating it once and not having to recreate the same process over and over again. Kirsten, as leaders, um, what should we do to generate data and analytics savvy amongst the employees? This is kind of a tough one. I mean, the easy answer, of course, is training and, and attending conferences and collaboration. Um, I, I will admit I'm, I'm a pretty big fan of working groups. I mean, I guess this goes off of my earlier comment about governance. Uh, and maybe, again, seeing this in multiple agencies, um, the idea that we do have data silos, although I guess, Ted, if you have silos and you have rocketry, maybe I have <laughs> regional grids. Um, <laughs> The biggest challenge, I mean, we need to get people talking to each other. I'm constantly amazed as I, as I meet people across many agencies. Um, they just don't know what their peers are doing. Um, they don't know that we already might have data. They don't know that an analysis might already exist. So, um, so in terms of building that analytics savvy workforce, um, so much, a lot of that battle is really just getting people to talk, getting people to realize that, pe that their peers, their coworkers, maybe just on another floor from them, might have already done all of this work or part of this work. There's a collaborative opportunity. Um, so I'm a big fan of working groups. Um, 
for that collaboration and community building. Um, I'm a fan of setting stewardship framework so people sort of understand the concept of stewardship, their the responsibility areas of data, they know who to contact, who's the person who knows the most about this particular data set, who can I talk to, who's the subject matter expert. Um, there's also, I mean, I know at DHS, my, my old program there, the, the Management Cube, um, they recently did a data jam. Um, those are really great opportunities as well to just bring communities together and say, you know, we have a, a mission question that we want to answer, but we want to crowdsource that to our, to our employees who might have ideas here. Um, so let's have a two-day session where we sit down and, and collaborate around data and think about what, what the art of the possible is. Um, so, and then we are at an Agile conference. I mean, I'm also a big believer in Agile as a good framework to constantly iterate on ideas. It, it puts that um, sort of discipline around the need to be flexible. Um, so those are, those are my thoughts around just building that data savvy workforce beyond just the traditional, like let's send people to training or, um, but just getting people to talk to each other often builds a lot of that um, savvy. Pamela, you have a unique challenge in that you have the national labs. So yeah. how do you get them involved in what you're doing collaboratively and then have them collaborate together as well? So the labs are interesting because they are um, out there creating things and applying new and emerging technologies and um, looking at business problems from their specific areas and then either adopting new technologies or building them, right? Because they're the research scientists and the uh, appliers of the research. So, uh, and then here I am sitting in headquarters and I'm headquarters who uh, is trying to do the same thing. I'm trying to get some innovations done, but I'm trying to get things done from a more holistic perspective. So I embrace the opportunity because so as I mentioned earlier, one of the things that we are doing is we created this Innovation Community Center, and at the heart of it is Innovation Exchange. And it's there because of the fact that the, the labs and the program offices and the department as a whole, highly federated, they have their own things going on, right? And all of it's valuable to the mission. But imagine how powerful it would be if some of these solutions were more holistic or some of these solutions were even reused across the department. So I have the luxury of um, uh, putting a platform in place so that we now can look at what information is being utilized where, um, and they can come to our, um, our environment to understand that taxonomy, right? So, because that was one of the, the biggest pain points is we don't know who's doing what where. And that's the same with data. If you don't know who's doing what where, you don't know what information is available where, right? So the first concept of the Innovation uh, Community Center is to build that uh, dialogue, right? Build a, a information map so we can find out what's going on where. Um, so that was the first part. And, and then this, and our, and our artificial intelligence team is the first consumer of this because they now can look and via our uh, new environment and see where are all the AI initiatives within the department. But behind all of that is what data are they using, right? What data is being utilized across the department? So that's an example. And these are uh, national labs that are involved with this and sharing this information and sharing their ideas and sharing their innovations. So we're saying let's, let's do things to, to cross, to co-create, and then let's put forth a concerted effort to start sharing and, and provide a platform for people to understand what's going on where. There's a couple other things that we're doing. Uh, we have uh, stood up a sandbox in the um, community center at headquarters so that the labs and different ones can, can bring their information forward to uh, some of their solutions forward to share it, right? So there is that that they're doing. And again, that's all about data. And then the third part is emerging and advanced technologies on what's new, what's emerging. And of course, with the labs, it would be, okay, what do you got going on that's new and emerging that, that we should be, that we should know about? Mm -hmm. So I think it's all about embracing the collaboration, reaching out to the different labs, finding out what they're doing, finding out what data is central to their organizations, and then bringing that information back, not like making headquarters a, a big repository of the information, but more of an information map. Okay. So, um, Ann, Ann's still here? 
Anne's still here at the end. Anne mentioned something earlier in her panel uh, when she was federal CIO about forcing functions and laws enabling us to do what you do. Part of this act, you may or may not know, is to create a learning agenda for our workforce. So that's something we have to do that has to get done. So we have to do so. Our industry partners may want to look at that as an opportunity. So how do you create a learning agenda for awareness? Um, we're looking at just, hey, you know, part of this is records management, and this sort of all gets intertwined in all this stuff. But we really don't have a solution up front with our tools uh, to classify things up front at the creation point. So think about this as industry partners. Can you find a way to help us classify at the creation point of what we do? It would be nice to, to when you open up, let's say, Word, hey, what type of data is this? Is this a record? Is this not a record? Is this should this be kept for whatever particular reason? So think about that as you build your, your solutions to maybe a little differently. Um, but part of, part of the act is uh, enabling us to make sure awareness is known, number one, and provide a way, an easy way to do these things. So it, it does have a, um, you know, people uh, may, may look at OMB as a negative thing, a punitive thing, but I think it is uh, enabling us to move forward. That's the intent. Uh, and it puts focus in areas that we may not have had it before. So People have to respond and then we'll go to questions. So I, I agree with all of the, the comments made. I mean, we, uh, when we're thinking about our workforce communities of practice, mm -hmm. um, having those support functions to collaborate across mission areas and look for the bright spots is the way uh, mm -hmm. I'd like to talk about is, is we have strengths in various parts of our organization. So we're doing those things. Um, data competitions. Uh, supporting uh, agencies in the data products they need by having uh, people from across the department compete and, and create products um, for them has been successful. Um, but I also have a personal philosophy about this, which I, which I think uh, goes back to this idea of, of engaging with leaders and um, raising expectations, right? Uh, when you give them something they haven't seen before and you build that excitement, uh, that is a disruptive function, and that disruptive function creates some creative tension. As we deploy mm -hmm. these dashboards, they want to do more. Um, they don't have a data officer. They don't have an analytics team to be able to do some of those things. They want them. So uh, that demand aspect of it, I think, is really important. And, and, the, and uh, the tools and technologies are available. The data is available. So it's just creating the framework and the infrastructure uh, and giving them, showing them the art of the possible. But I think just ratcheting up expectations has a way, at least at from a departmental CDO perspective of, of creating an environment where people see the opportunity and want to pursue it. Uh, and that, uh, that helps to feed those communities of practice. Because when you have that excitement, people want to reach out and find those best practices. So I think it's a combination of those things, the bottom up and top down as well. Well, thank you very much. Are there any questions? Here. So my question is uh, uh, specific to making data accessible to the citizens, uh, open data. Um, do you guys consider this is responsibility of chief data officer to not only massage the data uh, governance around it, but making it viral so that citizens are better informed? Mm -hmm. Thank yes. you. Yeah, you want me to start? Can I start? Absolutely. I think it is the responsibility of the chief data officer to make sure that it's transpiring within the departments, but I don't think it's the responsibility of the chief data officer alone. So um, one of the things that I'm advising my chief data officer to do is to uh, establish uh, data management responsibilities throughout the departments and at the different uh, agencies or departmental elements, as that's what we call them. Some people call them bureaus. But I believe that there should be data managers at the bureau levels, not just at, not, that responsibility should not just reside with the chief data officer. And in, as a part of that responsibility, they should be uh, making sure that information is available to citizens, but studying over that information to determine how that data is being utilized. Because it, n there's nothing worse than information that's provided that you don't need. Right, so, so we have to, and in order to get there, we're gonna have to work with the citizens in order to determine what they need. So I think of data.gov that's out there today, and it's utilized, I think there's opportunities to utilize it even better 
Um, and in order to evolve it, we we're going to have to listen to you and get an understanding of how we can make that platform even stronger and make it address your needs a bit more effectively. And then we also need you involved to help us come up with, with uh, categorization and, and um, categorization of the data itself. So, yeah. no, go ahead. I mean, to build off that, um, yeah, I mean, the CDOs, I think, are the champions of the open data movement, but, but absolutely it's not the chief data officers alone. I mean, that's the stewardship model, I think, is a really important one because the, the knowledge of the data, the often ownership of the data, really resides in the program offices, the components, mm -hmm. the bureaus, what, mm -hmm. whatever they're, they're called at the particular agencies. Um, and, and a lot of that sort of the actual sort of preparing of the data, the hands-on connection with the data is happening there. And, and so it's the steward's responsibility, but then through the governance model and the championing of the CDO is, is really what enables the sort of comprehensive pushing of that open data concept. I, I think we're definitely ramping up in the maturity curve. I mean, there, there, there's been an open data movement in government for some time now. Um, I think with the, with the Foundations for Evidence-Based Policymaking Act, there's a more holistic view on data, and I, and I do think that that's important because I think it's actually going to propel it forward. I mean, the public value of, of data is um, really hard to quantify, I think, um, as we talked, as Ron kind of mentioned some of those examples. Um, but what we've been doing internally at USDA, and we've talked about it today a little bit, is enabling our leaders to be able to make decisions. Right? And so I think that gives our data stewards throughout our department um, a better understanding of what it means when we talk about secondary uses of data, that we create data mm -hmm. for, for a certain purpose and maybe it's filling an administrative role, but there are all kinds of insights that can be um, developed with that data that we may not be aware of uh, when, we're, when we're first creating it. So that mental model shift internally I, I think that's actually going to really help to propel the open data movement forward because making sure the data is interpretable, making sure that we understand the lineage, that we have data governance in place. Um, when we just release data out to the public, it's not as valuable. So mm -hmm. I, think, mm -hmm. uh, I think that shift of a really holistic approach is saying, let's leverage it for internal use, for evaluating the effectiveness of our programs, um, let's break down data silos internally, is going to pay a lot of dividends in the open data movement um, down track. Yeah, we're, we're data liberators, if you really look at that. So, um, you know, we will never be experts, at least my example, I will never be experts in planetary science, heliophysics. I will never be an astronaut, although that's kind of cool. <laughs> um, but I think that ship has sailed. Um, but what we will be doing is, as is, is our panel members described, is looking at things holistically, looking at things for consistently, looking at things so we can answer questions that haven't been asked before. So data liberators is a really good tag for us. So. We have about two more minutes. Yes, question over here. I was really curious if you guys have any models of successful um, data programs that you have found in other governments, um, federal or state, whatever, um, international, around the world that you are trying, that you might be taking inspiration from or what good might look like? So, <laughs> so we're seeing great promise with the European Space Agency in this area. So they're, they're um, maybe a little bit ahead of us, a step or two ahead of us. So we think we can springboard on what they're doing over in Europe and we can, we can uh, not exactly the same, but, but I think there's some things they're further ahead. There's some things we're further ahead. So, but, but I think there is a really good model that we can use. Uh, and I'm gonna talk to my friend up here to the right. Um, at USDA, the dashboards that Ted's referring to um, are really, really impressive. And what was done there is really impressive work. I think we can share across uh, all government agencies for administrative data. So, Ted, Ted, I want to talk you up a little bit there, but, and, and we have been talking to Ted and the team that helped him within NASA to do that. So good, close practice, a little further away example from, from the, that side. So. Well, I, th I think the larger point is that there, there are bright spots around mm -hmm. government in different aspects of, of the data strategy. So um, one area that we'd really like to, to, to improve our accessibility is on the open data side. And there are agencies that have done some really interesting mm -hmm. things at NOAA and Census. Um, in terms of being able to make their data more accessible and um, even visualizations to, you know, not just for the data savvy to, to utilize APIs and, and have access to data they understand and can use, but actually the average citizen who can go in and consume the data in a new way. So I think that there 
are uh, many agencies that have done a variety of things that we can leverage, and we should. And I think that's uh, going to be really interesting when we stand up that Federal Chief Data Officer Council to be able to leverage those best practices. So excited about that. I would say USA spending is a good example. I think that one's pretty widely used, and people are pretty much relying on that. So that's good, accurate data um, for, for many of us. Well, thank you very much. We appreciate it. As you can see, there's a lot of uh, interest uh, around data, not only data strategy, but data governance uh, and, and how to use the data and categorizing the data. So there's a lot of opportunity for you as partners to work with our federal government agencies to take data where no one has gone before. <laughs> thank you.